All right, good morning, everybody. So now we have all that solved and taken care of. Uh, we are continuing our brain uh, teaser series, and what we've been doing is we're just going through, walking through several of the parables uh, uh, Jesus teaches, and as we go through those, uh, you'll notice they're just they're stories that Jesus would use to kind of teach a spiritual point or lesson to the crowds that we're following. So as I've been telling you, you have to understand back in this day, you have Jesus walking around with thousands of, of people following behind him and like him trying to find spots where he can teach them and so what he does one of the main reasons for the parable use is i'm going to tell you some stories that make you think and if you're not willing to think you're going to go why am i wasting my time listening to this guy and you're going to go away but if you were actually there interested to see what jesus was trying to teach you you would take the time to actually think it through and go that's the truth that he wanted me to get and you would get some good spiritual meat and some good spiritual truth out of these things so it kind of weeded the group out so you had the people who wanted to listen staying there and going, I'm getting fed and I'm getting new information. I'm learning how to be the person God wants me to be. And you had the people kind of going, okay, I was here for the show, but I'm not really getting anything out of this, and they would eventually drift off. There's a side thing, which is some of it. He was talking in code two for the Pharisees, but that's a whole separate issue. Uh, but he was trying to uh, kind of speak in code so the Pharisees would miss it as well and maybe give him a little bit more time to teach before they really wanted to kill him. Um, so that was one of the other reasons for it as well. So we've named this the Brain Teaser Series because with parables, they require you to think, not just hear. So you can't just come in today and go, I'm just going to hear it all and be taught. You have to think these things through and dig into them to actually draw the truth out of them. Um, so they're very much like brain teasers of modern day times where you have to think them through and you have to kind of think outside the box to get the right information or get the solution to the, uh, the story or whatever that you're being given. So, like each week, we're going to start this off with a few brain teasers that are just some gen generic ones to see what you can get. So this morning I have three new brain teasers. I'm going to put it on the screen. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to see if you can solve it on your own, and then I will give you the answers, okay? So here's our first brain teaser of the day. It is this. A man stands on one side of the river, his dog on the other. The man calls his dog, who immediately crosses the river without getting wet and without using a bridge or a boat. How dog do it? Okay? So there's a man. He's there with his dog. He's on one side of the river. His dog's on the other side. He calls to his dog. His dog immediately crosses over the river without getting wet or without using a bridge or a boat. How did the dog get there without getting wet? Or what was the other thing? Uh, not getting wet and without using a bridge or a boat. You have 10 seconds. Okay. If you know the answer, raise your hand. Uh, we only have a few. Rohan, what do you think it is? What? Did you say he didn't cross? No, the man didn't cross. Okay. Uh, Carrie, you've been good on these. What do you think it is? No. The river is frozen. It's winter time. Just crossed the ice and went right over to him. There you go. That's number one. All right, the second one is this. What makes this number 8,540,176,320 unique? And it's not the fact that all 10 numbers are in it. That's not what I'm asking you to think. What is unique about 8 billion? 549,176,320. You have 10 seconds. Shh, DeMarcus, hold on. DeMarcus said this isn't math class, Scott. <laughs> All right, how many of you have an answer? Nobody. Steve. Oh my gosh. Now Steve's trying to get so, so far outside the box that he can answer it anyway. All right, here's what makes it unique. We're a little off today. Alphabetically, they are alphabetically ordered by how they're spelled. There you go. All right. Now we get to the last one, which is now the hard level. I thought you would get both of those because I got both of those in my office like that. The minute I saw them, I was like, oh, like that. But of course, I and. There's my mind, and then there's the regular person's mind. So I understand two different levels here. So, all right, here's the third brain teaser of the day, the third and final one. Man takes his car to a hotel. 
Upon reaching the hotel, he's immediately declared bankrupt. Why? All right? A man takes his car to the hotel. Upon reaching the hotel, he, immediately is, uh, he is immediately declared bankrupt. Why is that? You have 10 seconds. I have James in the back. He thinks he has. I think that's James back there. Is, he, is that Jay? I can't see. He's got the hat on the shadow. Okay, hold on. Five, four, three. Okay, how many of you think you have this one? Oh, my gosh. I'm not even going to preach the rest of the day because you guys. T- Jay? <laughs> Jay, what is it? No, they were playing Monopoly. Got it? All right. See, so went to the hotel, had to pay the fine, and he immediately bankrupted and they're out of the game. There you go. So with that said, and with all of you being very upset with me this morning and disappointed in my brain teasers, we are now going to move on to the actual text of our message. So we're going to be looking at a parable of Jesus's found in Matthew chapter 7 today. It's commonly known as the speck and the log. This is one of the more famous ones that people have heard. So let me just read it all to you. Then we're going to go back and we will look at how it's in the context and everything and walk through it. Here's what it says. It says, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Okay? So that is Jesus' parable. Now what we have to do is kind of walk through it and go, what was it he was trying to teach us? What did he want us as his followers to grasp and get out of this parable that he gives? So going back to verse 1, which I didn't read to you, but verses 1 and 2 kind of set up why he gives this parable, why he tells the story. Verse 1 says this, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Okay? Now, this one verse is often completely taken out of context and isolated on its own and said, this verse is used to let you know as Christians, you're not supposed to judge each other, you're not supposed to judge anyone else, and judgment is not something that's supposed to be part of your life. And here's the thing. If you just use that scripture and leave it like that, it's a fairly convincing argument to make. Right? If you just look at that, you can go, do not judge or you'll, uh, and you will not be judged. Sounds like a great teaching, which is just don't judge others and others won't judge you. Problem is, we know obviously that's not what the teaching is. Jesus is not condemning uh, that we judge each other. That's not what he was attempting to do. So we have to look at what was he condemning. Uh, when you look at the parable, it becomes plainly obvious. What he was condemning was people who were hypocritical in their judgments of other people condemning them, even though they were hypocritical in their judgments, okay? So that's what he's condemning. So it goes on to verse 2, and he says this, for, uh, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged, all right? Now, this verse here, verse 2, has always impacted me ever since I became a follower of Christ, of how I view other people and how I make judgments on other people. Um, And the reason for that is, if you read that and think about it, here's what he's saying. The standards you use to judge other people with, the standard God will use on you. And if you think about that, it should make you kind of take pause and kind of step back from time to time and be a little more cautious about the judgments that you make on other people. Because to be honest with you, I do not want God using my standards I use for other people on me. All right, because I'm a human, I'm flawed, and some of my judgments are crummy. Okay, some of my judgments are based simply on petty little things that are issues with me, and so therefore I judge, and I do not want God using that same standard on me. So, what this scripture here tells me a lot of times is uh, you need to be very careful and you need to step back sometimes when you're thinking things about other people and making judgments in your mind or even verbally judging them to kind of pause for a second, be a little more cautious, step back and go, do I really want to be judged the same way? And that's what he's letting you know. Now, the reason he's addressing this issue is this. He knows it's a very prevalent issue amongst us, is that we have a tendency to want to judge each other. The reason for that is this. It's much easier to see the flaws in other people than acknowledging your own flaws yourself. Okay? Is that not true? Like, it's a lot easier for me to look at other people and go like, man, that's their flaw and their flaw and their flaw. 
and not spend any time looking at my own and, and I have them, okay? It's just how we are. It's much easier to get mad at other people for the things they're doing than to get mad at ourselves for the things we're doing. It's much easier to think others are doing everything wrong rather than actually accepting the fact that we're doing some things wrong. I mean, it's just how we are. Um, I saw a good illustration on this this week. It's kind of a gross thing, but it's a good illustration of this, which is he was talking about your breath. And he was saying, you have a nose right here and you have your mouth right here. And if you have bad breath on a day, everyone around you can smell it and everyone you talk to knows it and you don't right? But your nose is right here and your mouth is right here. You're the closest one to that bad breath and you can't smell it and you can't acknowledge it and understand it because somehow our bodies work in such a way that you don't notice it. But everybody else is the first thing they notice is they go, oh man, you got some right breath today. Okay, that, that's some pretty bad breath. And, and that's a good way of looking at this is we have this tendency to go look at everything wrong with everybody else and even though that same thing's wrong in my life, I don't notice it. I'm totally ignorant to, of it. I can't smell it. I can't uh, know it's there. For whatever reason, we don't see it. And Jesus knew this, so he's going, let me tell you a parable. Let me, let me help you understand this in a story. So now he's starts the parable, verse 3. He says, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? So in this, pat, this verse here, you have three key terms you need to understand so it puts the rest of everything in perspective. The first one is this, a speck. So when he says a speck in your friend's eye, he's saying basically a small fault, a small flaw, a small moral thing. So nothing huge, but it's something that's just not right. Then he uses the word log, which is he's referencing to yourself, which is you have a major moral fault. So there's a major thing in your life that's going on, and in your friend's life there's a smaller, minor little thing. So you have a speck and a log. And the last one that's key to understand here is this, that usually doesn't get mentioned here, which is the word friend. Okay? So it says here, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye while you have a log in your own? A friend is this, um, someone that you have some type of a relationship with. We have all sorts of different types of friends. We have what we would call um, people that we just associate with. But we would consider them friends because we work with them or whatever, and we know some basics about their life, and we have some type of a relationship built with them. So he's going, you have that all the way to your family and uh, friends that are close to you that you have pretty deep friendships with, where you know a lot about their lives and you spend a lot of time together. You have a whole range of friends, but he's making a point here. This is a reference to people that you have a friendship with, which is... If you're going to work on judging people and you're going to judge, you need to do it with people that you have a relationship with. Okay, that's how he's going to start this off. It's got to be people you have a relationship with. If you try to judge someone's behavior you have no relationship with, nothing good ever comes from it. Have you ever had someone try to judge you you didn't know before? Have you had that? Okay, nothing good comes from that. Usually the first thing you have is a defense response, which is you're offended and there's going to be a fight or you're going to snap back or whatever it is. We do not do well that way. Um, and verse 6, which is actually separated out from this parable, but I think Jesus tagged it on the end to kind of reference back to the beginning here. It's how I see the scripture. Uh, it says this, and it's a warning about this. It says, don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls and then turn and attack you. So it's kind of an odd little scripture here where he's talking about pigs and pearls and all that. Let me explain what I think he's kind of referencing to. He's basically going, amongst the body of Christ, there should be some judgment. We should have, because we have standards that we're all saying that we are living by, which is Christ's standard for our lives, that we all wish to attain and get to at some point. So he's saying, you don't take those standards and you go to unholy people who don't care about knowing Jesus, who don't care about your faith, who don't care about the scriptures, who have no desires for any of that stuff, you don't take the things that are holy odd and go try to put it on them and give it to them as if they're going to like take it and go, oh, thank you for telling me what I'm doing wrong in my life and thank you for correcting me on all that. What he says here is going to happen is when you take those pearls and give them the pigs, they're going to trample on them because they don't care and then they're going to turn on you. And this is a good description of what happens. 
people will take the truth of God if they don't want to hear it and you have no relationship with them, and they will go, I don't care to hear about it, and then they will start attacking you and going at you. All right? And he's giving you a lesson here of, hey, this isn't what judgment's used for. Okay? You're not supposed to take judgment and use it that way because it's not going to turn out well for anybody, and you're going to end up being attacked if you start trying to do it with people you don't know. This is why you do not see me or our church going out going, hey, let's go picket abortion places and stuff like that. Let's go do where we stand on the street corner with signs telling everyone they're sinners. Why? Well, because we don't know any of those people, and that's not going to accomplish anything good for the kingdom usually. Okay? It, it's not going to accomplish. Usually it makes people angry, and it makes people go, I don't want to be part of this. Uh, those of you, how many of you went to Winter Jam? And he, some of you went to Winter Jam. Okay. At Winter Jam, I heard they were in line, and Winter Jam is a Christian concert downtown at the uh, BOK Center. Was that the BOK? Yeah, BOK Center. They're in line to get tickets, and there's a group out there who's an anti-abortion group. Yeah, with, hold on, Marcus, with signs and all and pictures and everything, holding it up and yelling at everybody in the, in the line. And you're going, this is the wrong audience. You don't know these people, and this doesn't accomplish anything good. And that's what they were doing. And even our kids came back, the ones that were on the bus with me, going, it was crazy. Like, I don't know what they thought they were doing. And you could tell they were angry. And you're going, that, that is why these things are used amongst friends, people you have a relationship with. So if you have a friend who comes to you and says, hey, I need to, or sorry, let me move on from that. Go to verse uh, 4. It says, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye. You can't see past the log in your own eye. So now Jesus is going, basically, how can you say to your friend, let me help you out with your sin issue when that same sin dominates your life as well? Um, friend coming to you who calls you out on a sin in your life and says, hey, let me help you with that. But you know that friend deals with the same sin and you'd be like, no. Um, if a friend calls you out that's dealing with the same sin you're dealing with, and you know that a couple things happen with that relationship, usually you're shocked by their arrogance. You're going, who are you? Because you're the same thing. Why are you telling me that I need to deal with it when it's in your life as well? And two, you're kind of shocked by their lack of self-awareness. Like, do you not know how stupid this is that you're coming to me trying to help tell me I need to deal with this sin when you deal with it yourself? Okay? And usually what it does is it starts to strain that relationship. Uh, you'll start to have a strain there in that relationship. Or this one, if you have a friend or someone you look up to that calls you out on a sin and you start working with them to help overcome that sin or work on that sin or how you can start dealing with that sin, and then you find out at a later date they actually are dealing with that same sin and even worse, how's that one make you feel? Okay, usually what that does, that, that leads to distrust in that individual and it also leads to skepticism and the solutions you came up with that you were working on uh, in that situation. You see this one a lot from clergy when they fall, is you have clergy that are there and they're helping people all the time, and then we see them on the news and you find out they were having an affair over here, they were having an affair over here. And what you have is people go, do, do I need to like rethink everything they told me? Because if that was going on in their life, that discredits everything else they were telling me. And I was actually working with them, and they were working with me on some sexual temptations and stuff I had in my life. Does that mean all that stuff is bunk that they were telling me? It leads to skepticism, and it makes you go, I don't trust that individual anymore, or anyone that even remotely resembles them. I don't trust them anymore. So there can be a lot of damage done. Verse 5, he goes on, he says this, hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So now you see Jesus kind of give us what the, the goal is, what the end point is. And the goal is simply this, to help our friends find spiritual health in their lives in areas that we're qualified to help them in. That's the goal. The goal is to help our friends find spiritual health in areas that we are qualified in. Some of the greatest people you can have help you in your life with sins you're dealing with are people who have overcome those sins in their own life. Um, they, people have struggled with that and have overcome it. They can be some of your greatest assets that you can have in your life overcoming a sin. But people who are struggling with that sin are not going to benefit you. 
And the reason this is important to understand, in our culture today, we have a tendency to surround ourselves with people who are struggling with the same thing we're struggling with. Okay? And we somehow by putting us together, that somehow is going to help us all get healthy somehow. But reality is this, it, it never leads to health. It leads to acceptance of the sin and just kind of going, this is part of our lives. Um, if you look at how AA does it, and is Kevin in here? Kevin's not in here right now. Uh, some of the, um, I forget what that house thing is we have that meets here. What's, does anyone remember what those houses are called? Um, what is it? Oxford House. Oxford House and AA and stuff like that. They bring a bunch of people together that are struggling with the same sin. But their leaders supposedly are supposed to be people who have overcome those sins and are now helping lead others to overcome them in their own lives. They do not take someone who's an alcoholic and stick them up in front of the other alcoholics and go, hey guys, let's solve this issue. Why? Because you haven't solved it. How are you going to help them? They don't take someone who's struggling with substance abuse and go, hey, you're going to lead us and you're going to get up and tell us how to solve substance abuse because you're struggling with substance abuse. They take people who have overcome that, changed their lives, and gotten healthy, and now lead the group like a Kevin who leads a group and goes, hey, let me tell you how I've overcome this, and let me show you some of the healthy things that led to health that you can practice in your life. And so Jesus is kind of telling us the same general thing here is we need to look at getting our lives fixed so we can help other people overcome sins in our lives, then we can be a benefit to others. So with that said, let me just wrap up today's parable by giving it a four main themes I think God wanted us to grasp out of this parable, okay? The first thing is this. We need to be very discerning in our judgment of people's behavior. Um, what I mean by discerning is this. Be careful, okay? If you run around all the time picking out flaws in everyone else and blaming them for all the flaws in your life, you, you've got a problem. Okay, we aren't called to be that as Christians. We're called to be discerning here. We're called to not look for all the little specks necessarily and beat up all that. We're called to get the logs out of our own eye, be discerning towards others and go, how can I be a benefit to them? How can I be something that leads to fruitfulness in their life by helping them walk through some of their issues and theirs? But you have to be just, are they a friend? Are they just someone that's an acquaintance? Someone I don't know. If I don't know them, I pray that God puts someone else in their life or God allows me to develop a friendship with them so I can. They're an acquaintance. You know what? Me and Shane are probably going to talk about different things than I would talk with someone that's an acquaintance out in a world that I don't know as well. So the cashier lady at Walmart who I go through every week, who I know and talk to, or the guy at McDonald's, that's going to be a different conversation than the one me and Shane have. Okay? Why? Because I'm going to discern. I know him better than I know those people. So you have to be discerning in your judgment. The second thing is this. We need to accept that we're not the right person to help someone struggling with the sin that we ourselves are also struggling with. This is a key one. Sometimes our arrogance gets in the way, and we go, some people get the Jesus complex, which is, I'm Jesus to the world, and I'm here to help everybody out. And you're going, no, 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 no. You're not here to help everybody out. You're here to help out people that are struggling with something maybe you used to struggle with that you have overcome now, that's who you're there to help. But if you're struggling with it, you're not there to help them. You pray for God to put someone else that has overcome that and God use them to help that person, okay? And you have to have the humility at times to step back and go, I'm not the right guy to handle this. Um, I remember my first ministry, um, Autumn will remember this, but uh, my first ministry, I was in Livonia, Michigan, and I had this minister... He just didn't work. He was never there. Uh, like, honestly, he was at the office like three hours a week. And I'm sitting there like working. I'm like, this is weird. Is this how ministry is done? I'm like, I've never seen ministry done this way. Are you only supposed to work like three hours a week? But anyways, over uh, two and a half years, three years of being there, people just started to kind of go to me because I was always there and working, like to get stuff done. And I remember like three and a half years into it, like someone came to me and wanted marriage advice and wanted to know if I would sit with them to give marriage advice. Now, understand at this point, I'm like 22, maybe 22, 23, been married like a year and a half, and this couple's been married like 10 years, and they're coming to me to ask if I would give marriage, like sit with them and talk to them about their marriage, and this is one of the good moves I made. I don't always make good moves, but this is one of the good ones where I sat back. I was like, hey, I've been married a year and a half. Like, 
there's nothing good I'm going to offer you. Like, I, I'm not your guy. I, I shouldn't be in that role. I'm not ready for that role. That's not my thing. Um, so I'm going to have to decline that. You're going to have to go find Mike, and you're going to have to go ask Mike. Like, well, we don't know how to get hold of him. I don't know. All I'm saying is I can't give you marriage counseling. Um, and that's one of those things of having the humility of going, that's not, that's not my place. I can't do that one. That's not for me. And we need to do the same thing in our judgment when we're working with other people. Number three is this. We need to work on ourselves. Then we'll be able to help benefit others in their lives. Uh, so here's the, the positive of this. And we've hit on this several times over these parables. A lot of these parables are about working on yourself, getting yourself spiritually healthy. One of the big benefits of it is, one, just you individually, but the other huge benefit of working on yourself, God can use you to help others then. And so it's not just a selfish thing. It's a thing when I help myself and God helps me fix this area of my life, I now become a valuable tool to the kingdom of God to help others that are struggling with that sin. Because here's the thing, whatever sin it is you're dealing with, there's hundreds of other people that struggle with the same thing. You're not odd, but if you can overcome it, you then become odd, and then God can take that odd, unique thing to help minister to others. So there's twofold benefit to working on yourself, which is one, you benefit yourself. Two, you can benefit the kingdom of God and other believers because you can go, here's how God has healed me. Here's how God worked me through this. And I think some of these things might be beneficial to you. Okay? So that's number three. The last thing is this. Using proper judgment towards each other will benefit everyone and it leads to spiritual health. Um, judgment done in unhealthy ways brings about constant conflict and relational strains. But judgment done in a healthy way brings about a greater good in all of us. And so let me end it this way. I started with the first uh, verse one that gets taken out of context all the time that basically says, don't judge and you won't be judged. And we use it and go, see, you're not just supposed to judge anyone. Uh, the opposite is actually true. In a healthy body of believers, we are to have relationships to the extent that we do judge each other, that we are able to look at the speck in each other's lives or to log in each other's lives and actually have true conversations about those and help each other out of love and a desire to help each other become more spiritually healthy and see that as an acceptable way for the church to function that leads all of us to a healthier path. Um, if we are fearful of doing that, what happens is, is we allow each other to stay in dysfunction on our own isolate off from each other and feel like I have to face these battles by myself. And the cool thing about the church, and this is the, the, uh, the perspective I get to see you guys don't. Um, a lot of you, I know your backgrounds. A lot of you, I know what your sin issues are. Why? Because you come to me and you tell me, and I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. That's a neat little story. Or I'm, I actually get entertained by them because I'm always fascinated by people's stories. Um, but with that said, here's what I can tell you. If you think you are unique in what you're struggling with, you're not. I can guarantee you there's other people in this church that have struggled with that in the past, that have overcome those things. And the beauty of the church is, if I know those things, I actually try to direct you to those people. Is if you're talking to me, I'll say, hey, you know what? I know this person in the church has kind of went through the same thing. And um, it'd probably be a good conversation for you to have to go do that. And I try to hook those people together so they can have that conversation. Why? That leads to healthy conversations and it leads to spiritual health, not just for the person who's struggling, but for the person who's overcome because they get to see God use them to do eternal work in someone else's life. So for us not to judge each other, okay, we're actually robbing ourselves of something beautiful that God designed for the church. And so we need to be able to do that, but it has to be done in love. It has to be based in friendship. And through that, we all get healthy. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father.